Depending on your income, space travel may in fact already be commercial for you. Given that the cost for one seat on Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic is starting around $250,000, whenever they do allow for regular commercial flights, well, as I said, if you are a multimillionaire, then the answer is now. Well, not as of today, but they've already offered and sold numerous seats for a future trip. And as of now, it's unclear what the starting prices for both Bezos's Blue Origin and Elon Musk's SpaceX trips will cost. But if Virgin Galactic's steep price is an indication of anything, well, it seems like we're quite the distance away from commercial space travel, say the way that we travel on airplanes. Now, truth be told, even regular air travel isn't as common as one may think. Today on Life's Biggest Questions, we're asking, when will space travel be commercial for us? Smash that like button and buckle up, because this video is about to be out of this world. <laughs> So to start things off, we need to look at the history of space travel, commercially, in general. This isn't the work of NASA or government agencies, but more so independent countries such as Blue Origins, SpaceX, and Virgin Galactic, with goals of commercializing space travel the way we've done with air and even land travel. As we know, planes, trains, and cars have allowed us to explore parts of the world which at one point seemed impossible to get to. And as you can imagine, when the Wright brothers first invented flight, they likely weren't thinking about it reaching the heights that it's reached today. No pun intended, although someday I'm gonna be a great dad. On December 17th, 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright made history with four brief flights at Kitty Hawk with their first powered aircraft. This would later be known as the first successful flight using an airplane. Cool, neat. <laughs> However, it would take nearly five decades or just about 50 years, give or take, for the commercial flight era to really kick it into high gear. Now this was for a handful of reasons. For starters, in 1920, planes were being designed exclusively for passengers rather than for just the pilot. That being said, they held up to 20 passengers, reached very low altitudes of just about 300 feet, and were usually slower than a train ride. Given that the entire process was so new, they had a while to go before perfecting, which limited them to only day flights, not exceeding speeds over 100 miles an hour, and stopping for fuel numerous times. The cabins were also unpressurized, the aircraft was poorly insulated, meaning passengers had to bundle up for the cold, and the flights were very loud. By the 30s, things had improved with companies introducing flight attendants, much more comfortable seating, and a soundproof heated cabin. Still, the planes would reach only about 20,000 feet in regard to altitude and speeds of up to 200 miles per hour. Impressive, but compared to today's standards, well, it'd be quite a downgrade. Fast forward to the 1940s, and planes are now being constructed for the purpose of war, instead of commercial flight. Following the war, numerous countries, mainly European as well as the United States, were now left with brand new air bases, which would be repurposed for commercial flight, and a ton of newly built planes. This leads us to the 1950s, which was referred to as the golden age of air travel. That doesn't necessarily mean it was cheap. Just because it was much more popular and improved doesn't mean it was a regular occurrence for us all. In fact, as per Insider, a round trip from Chicago to Phoenix in the 50s, adjusted for inflation today, would amount to about 1,168 bucks. Which, I mean, that's absolutely insane. It's believed a one-way trip to Europe, again, taking today's dollar amount into consideration, would be upwards of $3,000. Now again, that was like the case for first class, top of the line service. I'm sure they had some coach seats for about 2,500, which still, not much of a bargain, but you know, glad to see you've come a long way in reducing flight prices. Throughout the 60s, things appeared to open up for more people. And by the 70s, it appeared with large passenger planes manufactured, companies were able to reduce the cost of tickets. By the 80s, the focus was to improve the state of passenger travel, as it appears it was in fact widely affordable. This is when smoking was allowed, there wasn't a limit on the amount of bags you could check, and meals were included with your airfare. Trips to the cockpit for children to see what the pilot sees became a norm, and by the 90s, in-air entertainment, such as movies and TV shows, became popular. And then in the 2000s, security drastically changed for obvious reasons, which I'm sure you guys could figure out what happened in the year 2001. More improvements were made to the entertainment systems, including USB ports and other commonly used perks, but overall, things remained the same. Now, as you can clearly see, even though flight was invented in the early 1900s, it would take almost like 70 years for it to become a regular thing. And as I mentioned before, to date, it's still not as common as we may think. Sure, going to the airport pre-pandemic, things appeared quite busy, especially a major city airport like JFK or LAX, but again, these are major American cities. Believe it or not, back in December of 2017, it was believed only 20% of the world's population had ever flown anywhere in their entire lives. Speaking with Jim Cramer, Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg explained, I quote, I think we're a big growth engine for the economy. And it's really, again, driven by what we're seeing in commercial traffic growth around the world. Less than 20% of the world's population has ever taken a single flight, believe it or not. This year alone, 100 million people in Asia will fly for the first time. Given that the article is about three and a half years old, on top of our pandemic, I don't think those percentages likely increased all that much. So to think after nearly 50 years of air travel being seen as 
common or affordable, still only one fifth of the world's population, give or take, has flown. Now with that being said, it's no secret that some countries are more focused on finding ways to increase everyday necessities such as clean drinking water, food or shelter, rather than finding ways to reduce the cost of plane tickets. However, even in the US after a survey of 2000 Americans was conducted, it turned out 13% had never been on an airplane and 40% of them had never left the country. 63% of the 40% who had never left the country cited the cost of international travel costing more than they could afford, while others highlighted the issue of finding time for trips in general. So as you can clearly see, even with all the improvements, cheaper airfare and all that jazz, a lot of Americans to date still haven't been on a plane and almost half of them have never left the country. So as you can imagine, leaving the atmosphere will likely take a lot longer to perfect, encourage and make affordable for us everyday people. But we can't just leave it off there. I pretty much just gave you guys a history lesson on flight and travel without mentioning much about space travel. So with all the knowledge we now have, do you guys think space travel for tourism purposes will become normal anytime soon? I highly, highly doubt it. To start things off, I mentioned that a ticket on Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic spacecraft with intentions of leaving the Earth's atmosphere and returning will cost about a quarter of a million bucks, which means someone who is a millionaire likely wouldn't spend a quarter of their net worth on a one day trip to space. And to no surprise, the idea of traveling to space for the purpose of tourism is going to be for the rich, at least to start. The same way that commercial flights were geared toward the wealthy, until these companies find ways of reducing the initial cost of a space launch, unfortunately it seems there won't be any Virgin Galactic tickets going for a thousand bucks anytime soon. And even a thousand dollars is considered a lot of money. I guess it depends who you ask, but I'm saying to the average person, a thousand dollars for a ticket is steep, regardless of where you're going. And given that the idea of space travel is still so new and unique, with Sir Richard Branson successfully taking flight and landing just the other day, well, the idea that anyone could board a space flight the way they can currently board an airplane seems incredibly far fetched. The reality is, unlike air travel, space travel is a whole other beast. We're dealing with things we never dealt with before. Given that astronauts need to go through years of training to even deal with what life is like up in space, the idea of a regular citizen going for a leisure trip is likely far, far away. However, a major difference between an astronaut's trip and a civilian's trip would be time. Some astronauts are up in space for years at a time, whereas us regular folk would reach heights out of the Earth's atmosphere for about four minutes, give or take, assuming you're on Virgin Galactic's aircraft or Jeff Bezos' Blue Origins. I mean, a quarter of a million bucks for four minutes in space doesn't seem all that worth it to me, but to each their own. Point I'm making is, if people don't like their ears popping while they fly on regular airplanes, you don't want to know what happens to your body and its fluids when you leave the Earth's atmosphere. Given that, aside from the cost, the actual number of seats available on the craft are incredibly limited, well again, supply and demand. You got 100 people who want to go to space in only four seats. The prices will likely cost more, say, compared to if you got 100 seats and only four passengers. Much like airplanes today, odds are companies would limit the amount of flights in order to reduce operating costs and ticket prices. But until we reach a point that these spacecrafts are traveling to and from space on a regular basis, and the entire world isn't watching, hoping for the best as they take off and make their returns, I think it's safe to say commercial space travel isn't happening anytime soon. And unlike commercial air travel, space travel isn't nearly as necessary. People take flights daily for various reasons, vacation, business, to see family, special events, health reasons, and so on. The only reason people would go to space would be for tourism reasons. On top of that, we know the Earth's atmosphere much better than we do space, so it's been easier to perfect air travel. Given that we're dealing with a whole new set of laws of physics and such, well, the science behind it all likely becomes a little tougher to understand as well. Here's the good news though. There are numerous companies trying to perfect space travel, and much like commercial flight, if you think the plane tickets with Air Canada or American Airlines cost too much, check with some other company. The same could likely be said for space travel. However, the costs will still likely be in the range of 100,000, maybe tens of thousands if we find ways to significantly reduce costs and improve the number of passengers. And it also depends how far we're going. Something that Blue Origin, Bezos' company pointed out just days prior to the Virgin launch was that Branson and his company weren't actually leaving the Earth's atmosphere. In a tweet with a graphic attached, the company wrote, I quote, from the beginning, New Shepard was designed to fly above the Kármán line. So none of our astronauts have an asterisk next to their name. Just for the purpose of this tweet, the New Shepard is the name of the spacecraft that Blue Origin is launching. For 96% of the world's population, space begins 100 km up at the internationally recognized Kármán line. A follow-up tweet also read, I quote, only 4% of the world recognizes a lower limit of 80 km or 50 miles as the beginning of space. New Shepard flies above both boundaries, one of the many benefits of flying with Blue Origin. The graphics attached to both tweets compared the ships, explaining that Blue Origin will be flying the 100 km mark, whereas Virgin won't. However, Virgin is also setting their sights on allowing people to actually go to the International Space Station, which as you can imagine, will probably cost closer to the half a million dollar mark or even million dollar per seat mark. Probably even more. 
All in all, it seems commercial space travel won't be here anytime soon. It's still so new that we got multi-billionaires, some of the world's wealthiest, trying it out and even this is seen as outrageous. In fact, given that the only reason for space travel would be for pleasure instead of for business purposes or health reasons, it seems there isn't much of a rush to allow it or even encourage it. At the end of the day, space travel may never be commercial for us in the sense of it's expensive, but people can still save and eventually afford a plane ticket. Given that space travel will be considered a luxury the same way a private jet or private yacht is, I wouldn't be all that surprised if space travel never becomes affordable for the everyday American. So to wrap up, I'm not sure if space travel ever will become commercial the way regular flying has become. But for the world's 1% who don't mind dropping a couple hundred thousand, maybe even a few million for a flight that could last anywhere from 2.5 hours from takeoff to landing to a week's time at the International Space Station, well I'd say, and maybe this is wishful thinking, but Maybe by the year 2050, given how long regular flight took to normalize. The beauty is, once you figure things out once, they become much easier to replicate. And following Richard Branson's successful launch and assuming Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin is a success, well, there's potential commercial space travel for the world's richest becomes a reality even sooner. Now, as always, guys, I would love to hear your thoughts on this one down below. Forget the cost. If you could today, would you travel to the edge of the Earth's atmosphere? Are you going to let a few more hundred or a thousand flights take place before you even think about it? I got a fear of heights, so NASA's pictures are good enough for me, photoshopped or not. For now, let's reply to some comments from the video, top 10 real life scary species that you never knew existed. Fox Jake said, what if Jurassic Park was an actual theme park? I don't think we would, I, I, I think we would screw that up big time. I think they would escape fairly easily and then they would just destroy a lot of stuff and we'd have to kill them somehow. That's the reality. The fact that like the bears and like chimpanzees escape zoos, bro. Dinosaurs? Come on. I am Billy said, us Billies have been around for a long time and we used to be king until the Karens showed up. Karens are just like, what's something that no one likes and no one uses and they just exist and you're just like, why are you? Karens is like the show Friends. Adolfo Cardoza said, <laughs> Adolfo Cardoza said, what if all the banks shut down? You know what, rather than make a video on it, give it another like six months or so. The way inflation's going, I'm sure it will happen. We'll find out in the real world. All right guys, that's all for this one. I've been your boy Pepper. Love you guys lots, we'll see you soon.